10,000 years as the ice is accumulated, that dust is accumulated in the dry season, and it falls out and forms the initial substrate up here at the start. There's strong winds. The plants that are colonizing up near the ice are wind dispersed, makes sense. There's an incredible amount of soil weathering that goes on. So in about 15 or 20 years, I would calculate, as you go from the ice, away from the ice, you go from pHs of 6.8, which is some of the nicest soils I've ever measured in the uh, tropics, to being weathered down to 4.7 pH. So they become quite acidic. They lost uh, most of their calcium in, that, in those 20 years and a lot of their um, cation exchange capacity. Uh, Francisco will be happy to know that a lot of the surface was covered by cryptogamic crust, which seemed to be very important in the successional processes going on. By about 20 years out, cushion plants and low shrubs start to appear. In total, we had not a complete, but near complete species turnover along that transect. Or in other words, in 20 years time, you went from pioneer plants to the start of what was there, what could be there originally, this high elevation tropical alpine. Um, plants. And then when you get far enough away, you actually start to see bunch of grasses developing and other co more complex interactive processes giving patterning to the vegetation as you move away. Well, that was us as scientists looking at the ice. Here's a picture of that dust that's falling out of the ice that starts that substrate at the very start. And within about six years or so, plants start to colonize that. Um, as you, but we're not the only people watching the edge of the ice, this is actually the people who live nearby. They're at 4,900 meters elevation. They're, they're up above agriculture, uh, crop agriculture, so what they do is raise livestock. Um, in this case, uh, sheep, alpaca, and llamas. And they're watching the ice, actually with more interest than us, because they wake up every day and they check it out. Um, we happen to have a situation where, because of the topography, the livestock were not able to get into that valley we were studying, so I didn't include human coupling in that previous set of data. But in fact, a lot of these slopes are open and will be used as new pasture land by local people as they observe these changes in their environment. This is the ice cap again of Kalkaya. Another thing we noticed is down below, and we confirmed this not only with people but with remote sensing, the, the wetlands that are down here, so the first flat part of topography away from the ice, are four to five times larger than they were 15 or 20 years ago. This is probably a temporary expansion. Um, in this case, this is a very large uh, ice cap not predicted to disappear, so probably they could potentially maintain these wetlands. In other places where the ice has disappeared, it's clear that the wetlands also will disappear at some point, or at least re be reduced. Well, this is one where uh, my students have then gone on to try to get the real story out of there. So this is um, uh, uh, an endeavor by Julio in his doctoral dissertation to add in um, uh, some important historical and social elements. He's also doing the ecological sampling, so he's looking at the, the transect that the, he's doing his own transect in the system I just talked about. So looking at vegetation change, he's using remote sensing to document the land cover change, but he's also using historical archives to figure out how long people have been using different parts of this landscape, what are the rules for the establishment of new pasture land, what are the social, legal, and economic limitations on making adaptive changes to this changing environment. So um, I'm sure Julio will update us in um, a few months, a year, something. <laughs> I won't put it on the spot. I've been working for a long time in Rio Viseo National Park, located right here. It's in the northern Andes of Peru. It looks out actually on the Amazon basin, but it goes up in elevation all the way to above tree line. Uh, I started studying tropical timber lines there in 1985. So I actually have some plots of forest that were marked in 1985 that I can, in theory anyway, track tree growth and survival over a fairly long time period. I don't want to do the math, but it seems a long time. This is the park itself, established in 1983. Uh, the boundary here is the high elevation part of this environment. Down here, it's lowland tropical rainforest. These are all districts where people live, high elevation agriculture, so the landscapes on the outside of the park, the buffer zone would look like this. On this high elevation ridge here, it's 
tropical alpine vegetation, and then inside the park, it's cloud forest. So we come in a gradient then all the way from humanized landscapes to tropical alpine grasslands to inside the park where we have an interface between those grasslands and the upper edge of the, of the, of the uh, cloud forest. So we have an opportunity to look at change across that transect and to st start to stratify out the effect of land use versus climate change in the area. How far have we gotten? Well, this is um, sort of work in progress, I'll say. Uh, Brooke Critkin, in a publication that came out in 2006, um, uh, work that he did is for his master's thesis back in uh, 2003, I guess it is now, put satellite imagery together of 14 years of change. This is the park boundary. This would be high elevation grasslands. This would be the upper edge, that green there, of, of cloud forest. These would be places where there's agriculture and a few Andean forests mixed in there. What he's done is he's coded in red change. So he's looking at 1987 to 2001. Change is, is red. In this case, outside the park, 25% um, of the forest disappeared in that 14 years. What happened? The human population tripled. Why? Gold prices. Um, these are gold mines on this side, and many people came in and established um, um, landscape, uh, uh, agriculture, and cut forest outside the park. Inside the park, the red refers to change, but in this case it's an increase. So during the same time period, we got 23% more forest inside the park, 34% more area in shrublands, and a lot bigger patches. And in fact, we were positioned this summer in a way we could actually see this part in here, and indeed it's covered by new forests places that didn't have forest previously, the, the forest is moving up above the tree line. When we first picked this up, we thought we had a park difference, that we had deforestation outside the park, protection of the forest inside the park. Now I think we are picking up an early signal of climate change, and we're going to go back um, starting this next, this summer, this year, and redo the remote sensing and redo the mapping to see how change has, has progressed. It's a complicated environment. It's one that Blanc and I have been working in now for, I don't know, however many decades that was, 20 years, I guess. Um, the tree line itself is formed by 120 different species of trees and shrubs. It's one of the most complex uh, tree line situations that's ever been documented. We tried to look for similar places elsewhere, and, and in fact, it's rather unique in terms of what's been documented. You get this inverted tree line, so grass-owned areas on the bottom of valleys, presumably because of cold air drainage, but also amplified by uh, what used to be the land use in the park before the park was established of burning and grazing cattle. And of course, there's been much invasion. Uh, there's a land use story here. So even though it's a park, there are cattle raised inside the park. Last three years, they have not allowed burning. And there's still some, some livestock in, impact to consider in relationship to whether climate change is driving most of the vegetation change. Um, how are we going to do that? This is last summer. So last summer we put in some uh, climate change monitoring stations. You might recognize some of these folks. That's uh, Matt Fry right there. You have a good eye. Um, what we were doing is putting in climate monitoring stations that are part of what's called the Gloria Project. There's about 220 of these in the world. The mountains of the world, high elevation peaks are set up with permanent <coughs> monitoring stations for vegetation, one square meter plots that are marked out, inventory for plants, and then you pull everything away that would identify it so they presumably fit in with the landscape and, and, um, and climate change can then act upon those plots. Uh, we did a gradient from the wet side inside the park to the drier side on the outside of the park heading towards where people were, but in each case the high peaks Another thing we did, uh, some other people might have recognized Alexander Ponet. Alexander Ponet, she has an NSF um, postdoctoral fellowship to study the establishment of woody plants, and she hopes to do a series of experiments, so not just observational, but to try to manipulate uh, and judge really what it is that's controlling or encouraging the establishment of woody plants into the area. And if you know Alexandra there, she is being enthusiastic about the size of the plants I guess she's going to be finding. Um, much of the, she did some reconnaissance this last summer, much of her initial field work being done this summer. Another thing we've been able to do inside Rio Sail Park 
is have this time perspective. We're talking about climate change. It's good to know.